Welcome to United in Action, Cultivating a Culture of Peace. My name is Steve Chu, and I'm delighted to be your host today for this episode. We find ourselves in difficult times with the continuation of the pandemic, growing inequalities, and a surge in instability and crisis around the world. If we are to holistically address these challenges, we must do so by creating a culture of peace to ensure that any progress we have is lasting and enduring. Today, in observance of the United Nations Vesak Day, we'll be exploring the Buddha's teachings and wisdoms on how we can alleviate the suffering of those in need and ensure that we can create peace within our communities and within ourselves. And what better place to have that conversation than at the New York City Zen Center for Contemplative Care. Now, let's find out more about what the United Nations Vesak Day is all about. On Vesak Day, Buddhists around the world commemorate the birth, the enlightenment, and the passing of Gautama Buddha. Vesak takes place on the first full moon of what is known in Sanskrit as the lunar month of Vesaha, usually in May. It is believed to be the day the Buddha was born two and a half millennia ago. On December 15, 1999, the UN recognized Vesak Day as an international commemoration. Since then, this day has celebrated the Buddhist values of wisdom, compassion, and tolerance as a means to foster world peace. Tsuji celebrates Vesak, or Buddha Day, at the same time as Mother's Day and Global Tsuji Day in honor of Tsuji's founding and the continuation of Dharma Master Zheng Yan's mission of compassion and relief worldwide. Tsuji marks these auspicious occasions with prayer, contemplation, and a Buddha bathing ceremony. It's a spiritual ritual in which participants make internal vows to cleanse and purify their mind and heart and take their next steps for the good of all humanity. I'm now delighted to introduce Sensei Koshin Paley Ellison, who's the New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care's president and guiding teacher. Sensei Koshin, along with his team at the Zen Center, have been doing transformative work around the world to teach people how to process grief and loss and showcase how we can care for each other and ourselves in ways that educate, empower, and inspire. Sensei Koshin, I'm so delighted to be here with you today. Mm. It's a delight to be with you. Mm. So I know there's, it's a very challenging moment in our collective societies. We're facing a bunch of different crises mm. and really coming together today to come to understand how we can, through our actions, cultivate a culture of peace. Mm. So I'd love to first explore with mm. you, uh, to share with our audience, how has the Zen Center and your team been working to respond to this moment? Mm. Well, to me, you know, the beginning of the pandemic was a time where Chodo and myself looked at each other and said, well, we're made for this time. The Dharma is made for this. Yes. You know, the Shakyamuni Buddha's teaching of how we can face impermanence, how do we face death and illness with clarity, courage, and compassion is where we are and what is possible. And so we really felt inspired in our bodhisattva spirit, that spirit of saying, oh, I can surf. And so for us, when we do three main things, we have Zen practice here at the Zen Center and what we call our one do, which is both our on Zoom and in person, as well as many educational programs where we're, we have a contemplative medicine fellowship for physicians, nurse practitioners, and as well as our foundations and contemplative care training. And the other piece of what we do is we do lots of direct care. And with our students and our staff, we care for about 150,000 people. And during the pandemic, of course, all of these offerings where we used to just be located here, 
in this physical space, which is delightful to be with you in. And now it became a global space. And so we had bereavement groups with people literally from Africa, from Europe, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, all over the world, grieving together. You know, actually, in many ways for us, it's about the embodiment of the Four Noble Truths. And like really, first, we have to really learn how to sit in suffering together. And the medicine of that is, for us, the medicine for fear is to say, I suffer and tell me about how you do. So not turning away from what is difficult. Mm -hmm. Like Shakyamuni Buddha did, you know, we're appreciating Visak and the birth of the Buddha. And just thinking about his awakening was he was just a person like all of us who also suffered. That's beautiful. So much of grief and so much of crisis can be feeling isolating, right? And to be holding a space where there is a sentiment of shared suffering, mm -hmm. not to just commiserate in that suffering, but truly transform, right? Using it almost alchemically to say that this is the source material, the raw emotion that I can use and not step away in fear, but to face that and transform it into compassion, empathy, and to care for other people mm -hmm. is such profound work. And yes. I think this as a model is a beautiful model to help us understand how we can face other crises mm. like the pandemic in a way that uh, really walks towards the suffering and helps those in need. Mm. So recognizing that a lot of your work is to help communities face impermanence, do you have any insights in terms of the values and actions that exist within the Zen practice that bring a sense of richness into our daily lives? Mm. Well, I think for me, the main value is compassion. Mm. And it's very easy thing to say. Right. Like, oh, we're compassionate. Almost at many places, you know, even say that in their mission statement, like we're about compassion. But really, how are you being compassionate with your staff, with your students? One of the shadows often for, you know, caring mission organizations is that we can get too external mm. and kind of lean too far out without balancing. Are we actually functioning with compassion inside? Right. And how are we caring for that? And for another way is really, you know, in Zen practice, one of the most important things is zazen, about seated meditation. And so we have about 17 sits a week and both in person and hybrid and just on Zoom. And so we are really, for us, another part of the value is accessibility. And again, you know, we have community members from every continent now. And so that they have a place that still even online feels like a sanctuary. So how we hold and reflect on how we hold our online space are we being as caring as we can? Yeah. And so for me, it's always important to look at some of the basics like compassion, love, and zaza. <laughs> Beautiful. And all of those kind of are yeah. recipes to prevent burnout, mm. right? Not only within how we care for others, but how we care for ourselves. Yes. It also leads us to think about how we create change. Right? Like, how do we support the people who are creating the change uh, within our community uh, and then to the broader uh, network that we serve? Mm -hmm. Right, And one of the key challenges that we see within our own organization and other organizations that are doing work in advocacy and community building is that oftentimes interpersonal relationships are the true roadblock to change. Right, there's the, the institutional will is created by relationships. And mm -hmm. if we can't navigate those interpersonal relationships, it can be really difficult difficult to create a lasting sense of peace both within ourselves and mm. around. And I'd love to explore if you have any tips and insights on how we can navigate these choppy waters mm. that can be our karma and our interpersonal relationships. Mm. Yes, that's such a wonderful question. And for us, that's a huge part of 
what we feel is missing in many communities is that focus on interpersonal relationship. For us, we really see it as a mandala of these three points of intrapersonal, so really working with your spiritual practice, and then interpersonal, like how are my relationships going? And then it's service, you know? So for us, it's this really nourishing wheel. And many people that we talk to who come here for training, you know, really feel like they, their interpersonal relationships are really suffering. Mm. And they, we don't learn. It's so amazing to me. Like in school, we go to, you know, our undergraduate, or our early schools, 12 years, and there's not really any learning directly about how do you talk to people? Mm. How do you work with conflict? Right. How do you, and it often feels, as you shared, like a roadblock. Like, how could I do this differently? You know, how do I step back a little bit and say, hmm, I keep, it keeps being a roadblock. Right. But in our Zen tradition, we think of it, everything can be a barrier or a gate, mm. depending on how we view it and our perspective, which is so related to the Buddha's, you know, teaching the Eightfold Path of right perspective. Yes. To me, this is so important for anyone involved in service. Mm. And before coronavirus, there was the pandemic of social isolation, mm. which is actually more harmful and has more morbidity indicators than smoking. Mm -hmm. Like if we don't know how to have social interpersonal relationships, we're in trouble. Right. My Zen students often ask like, well, how am I doing in my practice? And I usually respond the same way. Tell me about your relationships in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Do you know the name of the grocery store checkout person? Right. And do you know something about their life? Mm -hmm. What we're looking for is how do you engage your neighborhood? It doesn't mean you have to like everybody, but learning how to love everybody. Mm. Yeah. And not getting so caught up in if you like them or not. Right. Who cares? Yeah. What's most important is, are you being loving mm -hmm. and kind? You know, giving this prescription that one of our teachers gives is, you know, she gives a, right, she's a physician, she writes it on her prescription pad, which is to find and develop your five people. Mm. So who are the five people who would really show up for you in a way that would be actually helpful? Mm. And what she's found as a primary care doctor is that more and more in this age, people feel like, hmm, maybe my sister, maybe not. She's busy. Mm. Or she, she never really asks me questions. Right. And so the prescription that, that is up to us to fill, mm. not at the pharmacy, but with our own heart and mind, but to really cultivate relationships that are actually nourishing. Mm, that's beautiful. I think thinking about reflection as this foundation, right? Mm. And then coming to how relationships help nourish that. And in finding those five people, we're able to really fully participate not only in those relationships because we felt supported, but the neighborhood and expanding out to intentionally grow our community mm. and always coming back to this mode of reflection to think, am I in the right direction? Mm. We constantly need that feedback mechanism in order to ensure that we are in a space of peace, that we are in a space of growth and service to others. Yeah, I'm so deeply grateful for all of your reflections with us today. I know we're really celebrating Vesak and Siji recognizes this deep importance of engaging and fostering community. So one of the exciting things that we do every year is we hold a Buddha bathing day, which both celebrates Vesak day alongside with Mother's Day and the founding of Siji in 1966. So now I'd like to invite our audience to join us in taking a look at the first English Vesak ceremony uh, with Buddha Bathing Day. Mm. <laughs> 
Welcome to Tsuji. Thank you. This is the first time we are using the English simultaneously to celebrate the Buddha's Day, Mother's Day, and Tsuji Day. For the triple celebration of Mother's Day, Suchi Day, and Buddha Day this past weekend, the Suchi USA headquarters in San Dimas, California, invited local interfaith representatives and community partners to join in the Buddha bathing ceremony, which for the first time was presented entirely in English. This was my first Buddha bathing ceremony. I feel very honored that Suchi was willing to share this very sacred ritual with all of us in a language that we can understand. It's a very beautiful place. This is the first time I'm here. I'm always learning from other people, their religion, their culture, and this will be a great opportunity for me to learn this special ceremony. May we break the bad habits. During the ceremony, conducted simultaneously with headquarters in Taiwan via live stream, the faith leaders were moved to a deep sense of togetherness. The people who are coming here today, they come from different faiths and they can see how we respect each other and how can we live together in harmony and peace. One thing that I'm learning that I belong to a larger community, not only the Christian community, but I, lo I belong to like the wild religion. Because our world is so divisive, any and every endeavor we can do together to diminish that divisiveness is worthwhile attending and participating in and that's why I'm here today. As the event continued, many of Suchi's local community partners came forward to express their gratitude. My heart is overcome with joy and gratitude. This organization is amazing. The American Red Cross is so grateful to have such a wonderful partner, Suchi. We have very similar mission to provide humanitarian relief and aid to those in need. We're very grateful to you. Uh, you've been a tremendous help in supporting us over the years. So it's been our great honor to partner with the Suchi Foundation, and we look forward to that continuing partnership. The ceremony concluded with an interfaith prayer, where the day's theme of multicultural love and connection continued. I believe that we all have light within us, whether that light is Christ, or the teachings of the Dharma, or Muhammad. Let us work together. Let us radiate our loving kindness to all living beings. Weave us together in unity and love. When we bring interfaith leaders together, the one common cause is love, great love. Showing the gratitude we have to the Buddha and to all the Almighty God. Welcome back. I'm delighted now to invite Jasmine Huang, who serves as the project manager of the Dharma's Water team for Buddhist Tsuji Foundation. Dharma's Water is responsible for translating and sharing the teachings of Dharma Master Zen Yen to our global community in English. And they're also responsible for planning this year's Buddha bathing ceremony in English here in the United States. So we're delighted to have you here with us today, Jasmine. Hi, Steve. Thanks so much for having me. Mm, yeah, so I know we're coming to this moment and this session in a very challenging time where this confluence of crises, there's a lot of pain and suffering in the world. And I know part of the work that we want to do is to ensure that we can cultivate this culture of peace. So can you share with our audience after they've seen this video about the Buddha bathing ceremony, how has Tsuji been working uh, to really foster this sense of peace? And what role does the ceremony play? In it. Hey, thanks so much, Steve. Um, I really love that term you used, um, the culture of peace. And I really think that is the ultimate goal of the Buddha bathing ceremony. I feel like if we can provide the space for people to temporarily step out of that um, chaos of the world and take a moment for themselves and see that we need to first and foremost take care of our hearts, as Master Cheng Yen has often said, then I think we are able to kind of reset our hearts to focus on this sense of peace. And um, you mentioned the Buddha bathing ceremony and its purpose. And I think it's important to note that in Siji, our customs are a little different in that we don't literally take the ladle and um, pour water over the Buddha. And that is in part because um, we really want to take focus off the Buddha as an idol and actually um, acknowledge that there's a Buddha within all of us and acknowledging that we are all Buddhas and you're a Buddha, Steve. And I hope to cultivate myself as a Buddha so that I can treat everyone with compassion. So this sense of seeing everyone as a Buddha or as a teacher and um, 
very in gratitude that there's so much to be learned from each and every one of these teachers that we meet in daily life. And Steve, um, I think you actually attended the New York um, iteration of this Buddha bathing ceremony yeah, this year, right? That's right. Yeah, how was it? I thought it was so beautiful and coming to this idea of community and being able to come together finally after two and a half years of being in the pandemic and being super isolated. It was such a profound experience to see old friends make new friends and be in this space together in a moment of healing, a moment of reflection, and also to really reset our hearts, right? To have that moment to breathe and say, we've been doing good work over the past two and a half years. Let's take a pause and continue forward together as a community. Yeah, I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you, Steve. I think we can really all feel that sense of moment where we share with everyone participating in that global ceremony at the same time. And this concept of Buddha bathing, the bathing aspect is cleansing. And what we're cleansing away is, um, it could be a number of things depending on the individual. So it could be the habitual tendencies we've built up that we do not um, want to continue. Or it could be um, this chaos that you mentioned that we interact with on a daily basis, perhaps we want to um, focus on our original intentions and not be affected by uh, the negativity that we might inevitably interact with. So this um, sense of setting aside a little bit of time for ourselves and sharing that with everyone and um, taking this first step to care for our hearts. And I think that really is our ultimate goal. Mm. That's beautiful. And I think coming to this reflection of how we create peace, right? It has to start from ourselves and to take this moment to wash away our habitual tendencies, uh, wash away our afflictions, allows for us to begin almost like a renewed aspiration. Can you share with us some of the teachings from the Buddha and also Dharma Master Zen Yen that really help us as individuals bring that peace within and outwards? It tends to sound a little daunting when we talk about teachings of the Buddha or Dharma Master Chang Yen, but um, something that I learned from working with the Dharma's water team is that it could be as simple as the core values that Dharma Master shares with everyone. For instance, um, gratitude, respect, love. These are um, frequently heard values that Master Chang Yen talk about. And maybe we could take a moment to focus on gratitude because Buddha bathing is essentially a holiday of gratitude. And I think it could be comparable to how at Thanksgiving, people are reminded to feel grateful for the things we have. So Master Chen Yin often says that each morning she wakes up and she acknowledges and is so grateful for the fact that she moves her hands and she moves her legs and she acknowledges that she's alive and she's so grateful for it. But for instance, this morning when you grabbed a cup of water or tea or when I grabbed a cup of water or tea and I can take this moment, for instance, to think, well, thank you to all the people that allow this water to come to my home and for there to be heating to heat this water up and for there to be time um, for me to be able to refill my cup before coming to meet with you all. So I think taking a pause to acknowledge all the infinite number of people and um, affinities and um, opportunities that had to come together to happen for us to reach this moment, I think is a nice way to ground ourselves in gratitude. I feel that. And I think it's so easy to be swept up by everything that's happening around us in the world and feel that sense of negativity if we're not grounded, mm -hmm. right? Like the moment yes. that we stop taking life through the motions and we really intentionally investigate all of the cherished blessings we have, we can really begin to see how we can be of service, how we can help others in a way that uh, magnifies and enriches our own life. I'm so glad you mentioned that in helping others. But I think I'm caught up in enjoying my warm cup of water on a cold day. But yes, the other half of this concept of gratitude is um, expressing that sense of gratitude to those whom we serve. So some people might be familiar or others might find it a little strange that um, Siji volunteers, we make a bow of gratitude to each and every person we serve. Before we do anything else, we take a pause and let them know you are respected, you are loved, and I do not see myself as any higher or different from you. And this is why I actually started volunteering with Siji in the aftermath of a wildfire when um, a woman that Siji was accompanying, she was away and had came back to her house burned to the ground and she was holding her baby and covered in ashes and she was traumatized. And the fact that a Siji volunteer came up and hugged her and bowed to her and invited her into a space of safety 
and spoke to her in a way that she felt loved and respected. And in that moment of human connection, that was what she needed at that first point. So I think that's actually so important for us as, re- uh, as volunteers to remember, because oftentimes we we rush in with what we think um, the care recipients need. But um, I think this vow of gratitude is helps us remember that first and foremost, we need to see everyone as humans that we love and respect and can learn so much from. Mm, for sure. And I, I love that you're lifting up this notion and narrative of interconnectedness, right? Because uh, whether it's the cup of water, how many people needed to uh, really work design systems and to get us to have that hot cup of water on a cold day, right? Or this interconnected nature of people whose lives have been impacted by disasters. They are not uh, less than, but rather we are equal because we are all interdependent on each other's well being. And if someone is suffering, we are all suffering. I think that narrative flows so well into us investigating what does it mean to create peace within our community. And so maybe to transition onto my th- final and last question is really how do we take this work forward, right? Like ideologically things around gratitude, respect, love, these are great uh, notions and it's a practice, right? It's a practice to internalize these values into our bodies and take actions. And I'd love to hear from your side, what is the Dharma as Water team doing to provide resources, uh, materials and opportunities for people to actualize these values in a way that helps us create this culture of peace? I think that question is twofold, so I'll answer, address the first part. We cannot act alone. So Master Chen Yin um, has this metaphor of fireflies, and actually the team I work for, Dharma is Water team, we translated an article called um, Swarms of Fireflies Emitting Twinkling Light, and I really encourage people to read that short because even though the individual is one small twinkling light, collectively we can light up the sky and create this huge movement of um, brilliance and illuminate everyone around us. And that's where the importance of community comes in. It is not only this individual connection they're making with us, with me, Jasmine. You know, in the future, Jasmine may not be able to be here, but maybe Steve will be here in the same uniform, representing this sense of love and respect and gratitude for this person. And I think that was your first point. Could you remind me of the second question? Part one, yeah. And the part two is really about actions, right? Like how, what is Dharma's Water doing in terms of resourcing? I know earlier we talked to Sensei Koshin from the Zen Center, and he raised that really before the pandemic of COVID, there was already reporting about the pandemic of social isolation, right? So highly echoing your thoughts around how important human connection is and how we can't act alone. And so I'd love for you to share with our audience some of the resources that exist from the Dharma as Water and Saji side that they can really tap into to help uh, stave off that sense of aloneness, find community, and find meaningful actions that they can take together with others. Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, well, first of all, I want to share um, who the Dharma as Water team is. We are a group of people who really dream of sharing all the wealth of knowledge that Saji has to offer with more people. And because a lot of these core teachings come from Master Chen Yin in Mandarin Chinese. The team's goal is to build a bridge so that these teachings can be communicated and localized to anyone who can benefit from them. We're a group of very, very excited people who want to share. It's, it's like when you you know, eat a delicious bowl of vegan ramen and you want everyone to know about how wonderful this is. You want everyone you love and care about to share in this experience. So similarly, Dharma's Water Team, we really want to provide the resources that Siji has to offer in English to everyone. And you mentioned um, having this for individuals who may be feeling a little bit of isolation. So there are a lot of resources such as all English prayers and guided meditations that anyone can join in at any time. And I think it's um, similar to Buddha bathing in that taking a few minutes out of a day to just um, calm our minds and invite that sense of peace into our hearts. And when we are ready, then we are able to serve others. You may have heard of sajidharma.org where Master's Chain's teachings are collected in English and accessible to the public. 
And there are also resources that are more community building oriented workshops that the Dharma's Water team provide on the practice of gratitude, respect, and love. The most recently, there is actually a chaplaincy workshop for a disaster relief chaplaincy is a training program. And there are online Dharma study groups. If anyone wants to just meet people who kind of share the same interest of and taking in teachings that could be useful for daily living or to enrich our volunteering lives. Thank you so much, Jasmine, for all of your wonderful reflections. I think it's been such a profound moment to have you here sharing all of Dharma's Water's resources that allow us to cultivate peace within ourselves and our community. It's really this way of working both within and outwards that we are able to create this culture of peace. We must not walk alone. We must come together and build the community that can be enduring. And we recognize that with all of the crises that are happening around the world, more must be done. So so not only should we take action, we must also take care of our hearts and our minds in this process. And so we hope that these resources and insights that have been shared with you today are of benefit and we look forward to continuing to walk this journey with you together, united in action. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye. <laughs>